So today, everybody, we're going to talk about uh, what a coercive control looks like in California when it comes to the law about it. But we're, we'll start just by uh, establishing uh, what power and control uh, is all about according to the Duluth model. This is the, the model that most, uh, if not all, domestic violence agencies are referring to. If you're reaching out to the typical domestic violence agency for support, uh, the first thing they might whip out is this uh, Duluth model created by Ellen Pence in Minnesota, Minnesota years ago, but it's got a lot of really good information on it. Uh, the inner part of this power and control wheel is starting to get at elements of course of control. It's not uh, all inclusive. There are other elements, like for example, it doesn't cover technological abuse. Uh, it does, it, it talks about, you can see at the, uh, what, seven o'clock mark here, if we see it as a clock, using male privilege, treating her like a servant, making all the big decisions, acting like the master of the castle, being the one to define men's and women's roles. It doesn't quite get at the misogynist uh, perspective that a lot of covert abusers and course of controllers have in their treatment of women, turning them into servants uh, to minions, uh, slaves. It's a form of human trafficking, but there's a lot of micromanagement, micro-regulation around traditionally female tasks, household tasks, like uh, doing the dishes and uh, raising the kids and grocery shopping and preparing meals. They, these things can uh, subject a woman to daily criticism, complaints, pressures, punishments. Uh, and it's uh, almost like she has to be perfect in all of these areas, like he's trying to turn her into some version of the Stepford Wives, if you've seen that movie. Uh, but if we see the inner parts of this wheel, like using emotional abuse, that's certainly part of course of control, putting her down, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy, playing mind games. We call that gaslighting, right? Getting inside her head to make her doubt her perception of what she thought she saw or what she thought she heard. Uh, making her doubt her memory over time, and eventually making her doubt her sanity. So it's very insidious, the, the kind of um, emotional manipulation and uh, control that happens in this uh, kind of relationship. Then isolating her from uh, extended family members and friends, controlling who she sees, what she does, where she goes. With one of our ladies, he she had to FaceTime her husband uh, from the moment she left the house till she got to work, and then during her lunch break, and then on the way home, just to make sure she wasn't fooling around. Well, you can bet he was fooling around, because these guys are often doing exactly what they're accusing or suspecting their wife of doing, or their partner of doing. So so uh, getting down to like the five o'clock portion of the wheel, uh, or the clock, the clock, power and control clock, uh, minimizing, denying, and blaming making light of the abuse, not taking her concerns about it seriously, saying the abuse didn't happen, shifting responsibility for abusive behavior, saying she caused it. And what do we call that? DARVO, deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. DARVO, so common, it's got an acronym attached to it. And this projecting onto her that many of the things that uh, he's been doing himself or uh, uh, denying that uh, he did what she saw him him do and making it making her question that uh, uh, herself uh, over time back to the gaslighting that happens where he starts gaslighting her. And then over time, she ends up gaslighting herself, doubting, doubting her own perception of reality. Um, and she may end up minimizing and uh, forgiving and forgetting and numbing herself to the abuse, <clears throat> thinking, well, maybe it was a, just a, a one-off, or he's under stress from work, or he had this terrible traumatic childhood. Um, none of these are uh, excuses for abuse. Uh, they can explain the behavior, but they can't excuse the behavior. At some point, he's going to come to a crossroads, and he's going to decide who and what he becomes. Haven't we all experienced some form of trauma in our lives? And you can see that there are some women who have been made to become very bitter as a result of their life experiences. But there, there are other women who go on to become doctors and social workers and faith leaders and uh, uh, wonderful people that are using their uh, experience of sorrow and suffering uh, and the healing that's happened to them uh, to uh, help others. And so they develop even more empathy uh, for the suffering of others because of what they've been through and overcome themselves. So don't let him uh, justify any of his abuse uh, by saying, well, you know, I'm just acting out of my childhood wounds or you made me do it or it wasn't that bad. Uh, these are all the lies and the games that uh, abusers play. 
using children. This is so common with our with our ladies here that they uh, they uh, try to undermine the child's relationship with the mother, or they turn them into pawns uh, where there's to spy on mom and really relay messages back to back to him if, during the post separation period, or even during their relationship. Uh, who uh, what was your mom doing today while I was at work? You know who was she talking to? Uh, and then threatening to take the children away if uh, the relationship ends and working very hard to make that happen once the relationship ends, uh, mounting this huge smear campaign where he may accuse her of abusing the children or abusing him, set her up, get her arrested, get a restraining order against her. Uh, and then uh, scoop custody of the children. Why? Because then he gets to look good in the eyes of the judge. Uh, he gets to uh, save money on child support and he gets to, to uh, punish her where it will hurt the most with her children, taking her children away from her. Using male privilege, like we talked about being the king of the castle, um, with uh, coercive control. Coercive control tends to be a gender-based crime. And I'm really happy that uh, that Ellen Pence uh, uh, said using male privilege. You know, with uh, recent iterations of the power and control wheel, they're trying to make it gender neutral. But if you go back to Evan Stark's book, Course of Control, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life, that's the subtitle, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life. Now, we're not painting all men with this broad stroke or the broad brush treatment here saying that all men are guilty of this. But we're, there are many good men, many wonderful, kind, dear men that are still out there in the world. We're not talking about them. We're talking about the men at the far end of the spectrum in terms of moral compass, conscience, honesty, uh, integrity, um, empathy, remorse, self-reflection, they don't have any of those qualities. And we're talking about people that actually enjoy or get some kind of satisfaction out of causing pain and suffering to the very people they should be protecting the most. And you don't wanna take that kind of person to couples counseling. You wanna protect yourself and your children from that kind of person. And then here, look, using uh, economic abuse, financial abuse, very common. Uh, and one of the main reasons why women stay in an abusive relationship, and one of the main reasons why they go back, they're afraid of ending up homeless, especially if he's threatened to take everything away from her, to destroy her ability to earn an income, to, uh, if he's stolen all the joint assets. Uh, in the business world, we call that embezzlement, uh, but what do we call it in a, in a marriage? So uh, preventing her from getting a job if she wants to get one or uh, 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 contributing to the loss of that job with one of our ladies, uh, he was uh, when she got a new job, he would show up every lunch hour and force her to stay well beyond the period of time when her lunch hour ended to the point where she ended up getting let go. So uh, this is somebody who's actively seeking to sabotage his partner's attempts to gain some kind of financial independence. My aunt used to say when I was, uh, my aunt, my aunt used to say when I was um, a teenager, uh, just uh, uh, dipping my toes in the dating world, she used to say, take some mad money with you, mad money with you whenever you go out on a date. And then uh, that way, if, uh, if something happens on the date and you get mad at them, you've got money to take a taxi, remember taxis, uh, uh, home. You, you're not stuck. So uh, thinking about that on a, uh, on a broader level, uh, it's so important for women to have their mad money. And many women end up giving up their career or their education. If they're in the uh, course of becoming an attorney or a doctor or therapist themselves, they'll often put their career on hold uh, uh, under pressure from their husbands or just wanting to be at home to raise the children. And they give up their dream and help promote their husbands. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, he may uh, encourage her to do that or pressure her to do that. And then over time, make her feel guilty about doing that and call her a mooch or a parasite. And all his, all his promises to provide for her, then she gets put on an allowance and she has to beg for uh, any uh, kind of money that she's entitled to. So uh, financial abuse is huge. So think about all these sections as we're going through this power and control wheel in a minute when we talk about Family Code 6320. Then using coercion and threats, uh, making and or carrying out threats to do something to hurt her, threatening to leave her, to commit suicide, to report her to welfare, making her drop charges, making her do illegal uh, things. They are so good at making their partner feel guilty. I have a lady that just left her partner and now she's struggling. This was after years of abuse where he did terrible things to her, and but they were married for uh, decades. 
and she's uh, now she's trying to deal with the guilt of having left him. She wonders how is he going to survive without me doing everything for him. So uh, that's a, uh, what can happen is you end up getting Stockholm syndrome, where you really feel like your existence is wrapped up in the life of your partner, and somehow you uh, you you are uh, committed and devoted uh, to your torturer. So uh, that uh, it's a it's a horrible um, um, a, a, it's horrible damage that they do uh, to your mind when you're uh, spending that kind of time with somebody that gets inside your head and through threats and force and coercion and manipulation and gaslighting does all kinds of numbers on your on your brain uh, down to making uh, telling her if you are, if you ever leave me I'll either I'll hunt you down and kill you or I'll kill myself. And I remember one uh, forensic psychologist in the class that I was uh, attending at the time um, said, you know, when um, uh, he had one of his clients come to him and say, I can't break up with my boyfriend because he said he'd kill himself if I ever left him. And this um, forensic therapist, you can judge for yourself how much empathy he had or how, um, I don't know, hardened he got by his practice over the years. But he said, here's what you can tell your boyfriend. If you kill yourself, I'm going to be messed up for about a year but you're going to be dead forever. So uh, leaving an abuser, can you handle the guilt if you still feel that guilt? And if there's still some part of you of you that loves your, pers your, your person or thinks that, well, he wasn't horrible all the time, then I would invite you to take another look at that, um, the a cycle of abuse, where you see that even the periods of peace uh, were meant to keep you in the relationship and were part of the control. It's all about the abuse of power in order to control an intimate partner. And look at that intimidation uh, factor too, making her afraid by using looks, actions, gestures. One of our ladies was talking about, she has medical training and she was talking about how you can um, scientifically and medically, biologically ex uh, um, explain why the pupils of an abuser go black, like a, an expand, like blacker and uh, darker and take up more surface area on the, uh, at the pupil of the eye, of the iris of the eye, just expands to all blackness. You can explain it scientifically, but you can also explain it uh, if you are a woman of faith as I am, by uh, the soul has left the building and there is some other force in charge and it's not an angel. So um, that darkness that seeps into somebody's soul like that, that's not something that you're gonna take to counseling or try to work things out with. Um, that's a force of chaos, a force of destruction that's composed of lies. And you can't have healing with a partner who's made up of lies. Yeah, so that's this is the inner part of this power and control wheel. And you see the circumference of it. I was at a, at a Kaiser uh, appointment a, a, a while back and I saw uh, a poster on the wall and it had all the intersection of the inter, the, sorry, the inner section, not the intersection, but the inner section of the power and control wheel. It was lacking the physical violence, the sexual violence part of the wheel. And I guess what they really wanted to draw people's uh, patients' attention to was the fact that you can do a lot of damage to an intimate partner without ever laying a hand on them. But let's not forget that physical and sexual violence are also part of domestic violence. Um, so here's the um, the a current definition of federal law. So regardless of what state you live in, uh, we've made some progress with this uh, current administration. There's been some steps forward and some steps back, but the steps forward, what is domestic violence? If you look up the De uh, Department of Justice, federal uh, definition of it, uh, the just like like we said, the um, uh, it's uh, abusive behavior in any relationship used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another intimate partner. The way I put it is the abuse of power in order to control an intimate partner. But domestic violence can be now look at this physical, sexual, emotional, financial, psychological, technological, or threats of actions or other patterns, patterns of coercive behavior. There we go. Now look. Patterns. We want to look at the pattern here, not just an isolated act, unless it's something egregious like strangulation, which has happened to over 40% of women SV survivors. So um, uh, we're looking for patterns of behavior, and it includes, now look at this section here, any behaviors that intimidate, manipulate, humiliate, isolate, frighten, terrorize, coerce, threaten, blame. I didn't have to touch you to do any of those things, did I? So that's the progress that's been made federally when it comes to defining uh, domestic violence.
or hurt, injure, or wound someone. And then the, um, the chair at the time of the Domestic Violence uh, Council added, when I talked to her about this uh, definition, she said, uh, or wound someone or someone that uh, she loves or a pet. Um, so state law, look at the contrast. This is in California. You want to look up your own, whatever state you're in. And isn't that the blessing of Zoom? We have ladies from all over the country now that come and, and hang out in our, uh, in our cozy Zoom room on Tuesdays. Uh, um, look at your own state law and what does it have to say about domestic violence? Now here in California, look what it is. Uh, intentionally or recklessly causing or attempting to cause bodily injury or placing another person in reasonable apprehension of imminent serious bodily injury to himself or another. Oh, could we please add herself at least? But what happened to all the other types of abuse that we were talking about uh, federally? What a difference. But here's the hope in California, at least, now check with your own uh, state because there is a movement to spread uh, across the United States laws on uh, coercive control uh, because it's uh, more and more widely recognized now that coercive control is a lethality risk. And we'll talk about why in a moment. But here, here's language from the law. It's a pattern, that's key, a pattern of behavior that in purpose or effect unreasonably interferes with a person's free will and personal liberty. You see, it's a liberty crime. It's a political crime. Why? Because it violates a woman, a citizen's um, fundamental human right to live in peace and safety in her own home. It's a violation of our basic fundamental human right of every man, woman, and child to live in peace and safety in their personal life peace, freedom, safety. So um, how did they get coercive control into uh, family court to make it grounds for a restraining order? They did it by expanding the definition of disturbing the peace. And you see this highlighted section here, disturbing the peace of the other party. Um, and it refers to conduct that, now here, this is where you wanna to talk to your attorney about it. This is, I'm not giving you legal advice here, but everything that I'm talking to you about now, run it by your attorney. If you're in the process of thinking about a restraining order or talk to your therapist about it, if you're you know, needing to heal from the type of abuse that doesn't leave physical signs of injury, but can break your heart and lead to other things like diabetes and cancer and stroke, all kinds of horrible physical ailments can come about because Coercive control takes a huge toll on your immune system. When you're standing in the middle of, uh, you know, I-5 or some, you know, busy highway and uh, people are asking you to conduct life as normal, like uh, fill out this form, get this work done, and you're busy dodging trucks, uh, it can take a huge toll on your immune system. When you're not just fighting off the bear, right, with your fight flight response, but you have the bear living with you or stalking you on a daily basis. So um, disturbing the peace, uh, when you wanna start making, uh, jotting down notes, even if it's bullet point form about the types of abuse you experienced, events that happened that made you feel afraid, ashamed, humiliated, isolated, trapped, all start with your inside feelings and then um, uh, reverse engineer uh, your feeling to back to what was the event that caused that. Were you uh, driving on the highway? Uh, was your husband driving uh, you home from a party and didn't like the fact that you were talking to some guy for a little longer than you should have? And does he start? Does his foot get heavier and heavier on the accelerator? And when you ask, uh, express concern about that, does it get even heavier? And are you now going 100 miles an hour? Or if you get really upset and ask him to slow the, slow the f down, does he stop in the middle of the highway? Isn't that teaching you not to rock the boat? Why? Because you're afraid of what will happen if you ask for change or point out something that he's doing that's frightening you or uh, making you feel ashamed or humiliated. So um, this type of person does not respond well to criticism, to requests for change that typically will do more of what you ask them not to do. So, But you want to establish a pattern of his behavior uh, unless it's a one-off event, like strangulation will certainly qualify. And for those of you who just joined, over 40% of the survivors that I have worked with in the past 13 years, of the 1,400 survivors that I've worked with in the past 13 years have experienced non-fatal strangulation at the hands of their partner, their doctor, lawyer, therapist, engineer, uh, a faith leader, partner. So it can happen to anyone and, and it qualifies as uh, attempted murder, even if it happens in the bedroom. As soon as a man puts his hands on your throat and squeezes, uh, that's an assault, that's not intimacy.
And he's telling you, I have your life in my hands and I can end it anytime I want. That's what we're dealing with here. That's why coercive control with or without physical violence attached to it is a lethality risk. And why is that? Because it's turning someone into a possession, into a resource, uh, into an object. Uh, but the key here is a possession. And what's the ultimate right of property possession? Disposal the right to dispose of it when it's no longer deemed to be useful or is starting to cause trouble. Treating people like objects and children, that's what puts them at risk of physical and sexual abuse from uh, a partner, uh, from a, a parent like this. So uh, this coercive control legislation in family court, family code 6320, based on the totality of the circumstances disturbing his partner's peace, destroying the mental or emotional calm of the other party, Thank God they're finally recognizing that, um, that it's not just physical abuse anymore. Uh, emotional, psychological abuse counts too. And also other abuse, including uh, use of the phone, text messages, online accounts, internet connected devices, or other electronic technologies. So look at that, technological abuse, and it's rampant in our survivors. So many of them have had their phones and their laptops uh, hacked into. Uh, other examples of course control, and this is still in Family Code 6320 in the language there, it's isolating the other part. Remember our power and control wheel, isolating the other party from friends, relatives, or other sources of support, making it harder and harder for her to hang out with her friends or have any other kind of life outside her partner, depriving the other party of basic necessities. How about like uh, if she has a um, life-threatening asthma condition, and the night she tells her husband that she wants a divorce, uh, he ramps her up to the point where he's threatening her and towering over her and intimidating her to the point where she's having starts to have a full blown asthma attack. She runs around searching for her inhaler, and guess what? It's gone missing. She goes to call nine one one, and he says, "Don't call for an ambulance. I'll drive you to the hospital." And he gets her in the car and he drives her to the hospital, but he's driving five miles an hour the whole way there with an eerie smile on his face. And if she had died on the way to the hospital, what would it have read in the coroner's report? Wouldn't it have read, do you think, death by natural causes? And look at this poor devoted husband just trying to get her to the hospital on time, not even wasting time for the ambulance to arrive. But what would you call it, knowing the circumstances that she came out of a history of course of control, terrible abuse, and had called was calling an end to it, taking her power back? And that's when a coercive controller becomes most dangerous when you tell him that he's no longer in control of you. And you say, you're not the boss of me anymore. Once he knows that cat is out of the bag, then that's when the lethality risk skyrockets. So, uh, because why? You're signaling to him that he's no longer in control. Uh, controlling, con that's the key word here. Controlling, regulating, or monitoring the other party's movements, communications, daily behavior, finances, economic resources, or access to services. So financial abuse uh, qualifies as grounds uh, for when you're looking at the totality of uh, the circumstances as grounds for a restraining order in family court, which if violated can become a criminal case. Then look at this, compelling the other party by force, threat of force, or intimidation including threats based on actual or immigration status. So many women have ended up having sex with their partners because not because they wanted to. It was not consensual sex at all, but they knew what would happen if they didn't. It was a survival tactic. Uh, that uh, The force, the fraud, the coercion, like uh, the um, uh, signing the income tax form for her as a form of financial abuse, uh, telling her if she ever leaves him, he'll hunt her down or uh, he'll take the kids. Uh, that force, fraud, coercion, those are three elements of human trafficking. Do you see the crossover between uh, coercive control and human trafficking? Um, engaging in reproductive coercion, forcing her to have another child if she's not ready to, or forcing her to get an abortion, uh, um, or something called stealthing, removing a condom during a, a intimacy, poking holes in it, sneaking up on her. So this coercive control is now grounds for a restraining order in family court in California. And it's a pattern of threatening, isolating, controlling behavior. Uh, it ranges everywhere, anywhere from gaslighting, in the beginning, the charm and the love bombing, it's all part of uh, bringing her in uh, and uh, casting his spell, all the better to control her. It ranges anywhere from gaslighting to uh, near fatal, 
non-fatal and fatal strangulation and anything in between. It is a lethality risk, as we mentioned, a form of human trafficking. It's a gender-based crime. Just look at Evan Stark's subtitle, Coercive Control, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life. That's not to say that women can't be, cannot be co uh, coercively controlling, especially in, um, in LGBTQ gay, uh, gay relationships, or uh, you uh, can sometimes find it in uh, mothers towards children. But by far, the overwhelming majority of coercive controlling perpetrators are male and the overwhelming majority of uh, uh, victims are female. And then that goes for domestic violence victims in general. About 85% of domestic violence uh, victims, crime victims are female. And I say victim because you are it's a victim of a crime, not victim mentality, but victim of a crime. Um, that's what domestic violence is. It's not a communication issue. It's not an anger issue, it's a control issue, and it's a character issue. And it's best handled with education and safety planning, and that's what our focus is here. So uh, I do a lot of trainings for therapists because as uh, a therapist just told me on Friday when I was doing a training for their therapists, the uh, new graduates are still not getting training on covert abuse or coercive control. It's just, uh, yeah, we have a lot of work to do in that regard. So it's, I also call it a form of uh, identity theft. Why? Why is coercive control a form of identity theft? Because it robs you of everything you were before getting into this relationship. It robs you of your freedom, your uh, sense of self-respect, your self-esteem, your confidence, your memory, uh, often your finances, your uh, relationship with your children, uh, often your career, your reputation, because he goes after all of those things and seeks to destroy them. And it's little by little, incremental, death by a thousand cuts. So it's the ultimate form of identity theft, as well as a lethality risk, right up there with gun ownership and ending the relationship. So that, in a nutshell, a big nutshell, is what Family Code 6320 is all about and why it's grounds for a restraining order, which if violated can become a criminal case. And that's why police should be aware of it as well. If any of what I'm talking about resonates with you and you want to see this work continue, would you take a moment and click on the uh, like button? Maybe another moment to click on the subscribe button. How about a third moment to uh, click on or go visit uh, womensv.org and click on the donate button to help us keep this program going. So uh, like, subscribe, donate, LSD, easy to remember. Uh, thank you everybody and let's keep doing the work.